Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, as, as announced, this lecture is in English. Uh, Andi Menschen in Wien, Entschuldigung, ich habe ja ein bisschen Deutsch gelernt, aber nicht genug, um einen Vortrag zu halten. So it's going to have to be in English. Um, and I wanted to thank the friends of the Weltmuseum, especially Dennis, for this kind invitation to speak to you on an indigenous Amazonian matter at the Weltmuseum today. Uh, today is the United Nations International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. And so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a privilege to have this responsibility. Mm, it's also particularly relevant and good that I begin with a land acknowledgement. I am a professor at the University of Regina in the prairies of the province of Saskatchewan in Canada. And my institution is located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory. These lands where I live and work are the ancestral lands of the Cree, the Soto, the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota peoples, and it's also the homeland of the Mishif. This land acknowledgement serves an important purpose, and it's going to be relevant today when I speak about indigenous peoples half a continent away. The land acknowledgement is a reminder. It's a reminder of past promises, of agreements between different peoples who found themselves living on the same lands. And what the agreement in the treaties laid out was how people would live together, how they would share, how they would respect each other. In summary, it was an agreement on how they would relate to each other. And I keep thinking that if indigenous Amazonian people, again, thousands of kilometers south of where I am right now, were studying this situation in North America and analyzing it, they would say that what happened after the treaties, the violence, the expropriation of land, forced attendance in church-run boarding schools, intentional policies to destroy indigenous languages, the indigenous Amazonians would say that it was a failure of memory, that people, the settlers in particular, did not remember what a proper relationship should be like. And I'm going to keep saying that a few times. I mean, there's a lot of, in, in how they talk about social relations and ethics and morality, they keep talking about it as a question of remembering remembering the good, remembering how to behave. Uh, yeah, because for the, for the Amazonian people I worked with, uh, the sense that being skillful and ethical in one's way of engaging with other people, of relating to them, is very much a question of remembering intelligently, remembering reflexively. So um, that's what I'll start with. The picture you see on the screen is my dear friend who died a couple of years ago and uh, went hunting and never returned. And he's mixing tobacco paste with vegetable salt. They consume this by licking it and it's a sacred substance. And I always felt that the concept of how they spoke about tobacco made it sound very similar, or it served some of the same intellectual and conceptual purposes that we in the West, pop culture, but also in academia, uh, do with the concept of culture. Uh, just a quick pause. Uh, Alexandra or Tina, if in about half an hour you could tell me Interrupt shamelessly and tell me I'm taking too long. Please let me know. I expect to be about 35 minutes. Okay, let me move on. So this was the original title, An Indigenous Concept of Culture. Um, I would now change it to something more like this. 
taking tobacco seriously, a comparison of the concepts of tobacco and culture. And in fact, if I develop that title a little more, I would add a comparison of the analytical concepts of tobacco and culture. When you take another people's concept seriously, you, you're really embracing those concepts and treating them as viable ways of thinking about existence, as theoretical concepts that are useful in their own right. And this is what anthropologists do. We go, we live with people. In my case, I went and lived in the Amazon with people at the center for a couple of years. And I learned to deploy their own concepts in thinking about their own social lives analytically. So I hope you'll take that as, 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 a, as, a, as a rigorous, polite, and engaged way of dealing with others, is treating their concepts seriously. Um, tobacco, the term in the language I learned, we used to call the language muinane, now we call it fenemuna is a key material element in a social process that shapes people. It's about shaping skillful, ethical human beings. And tobacco is a key element that they use for that. Baño is the term. And if you think about it, culture, that concept, serves a similar purpose. We talk about culture uh, among other ways, as this process of uh, shaping people. So they're both about making people. And um, by the way, the Amazonians, I, as, as I dealt with them, were very, very humorous people. And there's lots of talk about rituals being about making people. And the purpose of social existence is to make new generations of people. But then they would jokingly make fun of the fact they would say like oh i know how to make people right talking about sex basically um okay so about tobacco and the comparison with culture tobacco is a plant it's also a cooked paste that's what you see right there mixed with vegetable salt, you lick it. It is a powerful, powerful substance. You lick it, it can cause you to get dizzy, sweat. Uh, if you're not used to it, it can be quite unpleasant. They threatened me that it could make your bowels loose. People would shit themselves, literally, if they took too much of this stuff. Uh, but it also, it's, it, it also awakens you, speaks to you. Tobacco is the creator deity, the god. When they talked about the creator deity, Banyotadi, the grandfather of tobacco. It's also a seminal substance. It's the semen that comes from the creator and it travels within families. Families are understood to center on patrol lines, men who have a set of children, the women marry out, the men stay in the house and they reproduce. The, and tobacco is understood to be transmitted intergenerationally among these people. And like I said, tobacco is the fundamental material of human beings flesh, human beings' tissue. I will have an opportunity to get back to that. The concepts of culture in the West and the concept of tobacco among people of the center are both used to explain the behavior of persons within groups over generations. Why do Slavs squat and drink beer? Why do Germans speak the language that they do? Why do Colombians go to church on Sundays? This is the behavior of persons within groups over generations. 
the response in the West is that's their culture. Among people of the center, they would say that's their tobacco. Tobacco's used and culture are used to explain the differences between the ways in which different collectives behave, organize their lives, reproduce, and so on. So that's how you explain differences between Germans, Colombians, etc. culture. Culture is what explain differences. <laughs> Among people of the center, they would say it's the tobaccos. <clears throat> Finally, to some extent or another, culture and tobacco are used to account for the moral qualities of persons and groups behaviors. So let me now go geeky and academic on you and take you a little bit into the history of that word culture and its many meanings to, to ab abstract from that some of the key ones, right? The origin of the term is from Roman times, the Latin language, a couple of thousand years ago. And the term was colere. And tied to colere, if you inflect it, the term was cultura. And it meant to inhabit, to cultivate, to protect, and to honor with worship. You'll recognize some of these words, like what is a cult? Comes from cultura and colere. Uh, from the sense to inhabit, you have colony, colonize, and certainly cultivate. But let's focus on that concept of cultivation, right? In its early uses, culture, Later on, in French, culture, uh, it referred to the tending of something. Usually, it was the tending of crops, a tract of land that you cultivated. That was the culture of the land. The husbandry of animals, raising and taking care of animals. So it was always the culture of something. But by the early 16th century, remember, Latin wasn't really spoken as a living language anymore. It had become Spanish, French, uh, Romanian, Italian, and other languages. And it had influenced uh, English and German. By the early 16th century, those babies of that term cultura were extended by metaphor. Culture, Culture in French came to refer to a process of human development. You cultured, you cultivated the mind. Francis Bacon, 1605, spoke of the culture and manurance of minds. The culture of mind. So that it was a metaphor, just like you can take a piece of land, wild with meadow plants growing in it, and you can cut those plants out, burn it. Then you can take a plow to that land, and you can make irrigation channels, and you can throw manure. That's that manurance, right? You can manure that terrain, throw seeds on it, and it'll produce wheat. It'll produce good stuffs that you want to grow, right? This was extended metaphorically to mines you could cultivate minds, you could cultivate people. But it's, this was thought of as a metaphor. Hobbes too, around the same time, spoke of a culture of the mind. Over the years, people became used to the metaphor and they stopped thinking about it as a metaphor, that you can treat a mind like you treat the land. And they started thinking of it literally, they really conceived of the culture of the mind as, as, as a literal process. The mind is being cultivated. We are literally doing that. It's not a metaphor. Another Something else happened between the 17th and the 19th century, which was you stopped needing to say culture of this or that, right? You could take away culture of the mind. 
you can take away of the mind and just say culture. It stood as a process, as a general process on its own. But it was very snobbish in how it was used in Europe. In England, certainly very snobbish. This general process of the cultivation of people, the process of culture, only belonged to the upper classes. So from 1744, there's a quote, it has not been customary for persons of either birth or culture to breed up their children to the church. Jane Austen said about somebody having every advantage of discipline and culture. So notice she no longer needed to speak of culture of the mind or culture of sensitivities, sensibilities. It was culture, tout court. It was imagined to be a standalone process, but only the wealthy, the aristocrats, the noble had culture. You'll be interested to know that in the German speaking world, uh, they borrowed the term culture from French and it became culture in German. But in German, it was really tied to another, to the meanings of another French word. Civilization, civilization. They thought of culture as civilization, as a process, a single line on which all human beings were a single path and all human societies were on that same path. The idea was that some people were way behind along that path. They were savages. They did not have agriculture. They hunted with simple spears or bows and arrows, right? Their languages were simple, supposedly. Then along that path, a society, a culture, whoops, would move towards barbarism, the next stage up where they might have agriculture, slightly more complex language, and greater complexity, and so on. There would be other stages, and eventually that single path would lead to the most civilized, best, most elegant, most beautiful culture, most complex languages, most thorough systems of law and social control civilization along European lines. The Germans felt it was German. French and English felt it was French culture and English culture, or the West. That really was the apex of that single process of development and civilization. Not everybody agreed and some lovely characters among the Romantics protested. Johann Gottfried Herder, for instance, said that the very thought of a superior European culture is a blatant insult to the majesty of nature. So he rejected that idea that there was a single path leading up to that ultimate great culture, which was the West. Not for Herder. Hedde argued that you needed to use that term culture in the plural. There were many cultures, variable cultures from different nations at different points in time. And so rather than one single arrow of civilization, one single path of development, you had culture A, culture B, culture C, and each one had its virtues, its path, its process. So culture now has many meanings, hundreds, in fact. We can talk about sugar beet culture, germ culture, a culture of bacteria on a Petri dish. You can still use it in that opera house kind of snobbish sense as a general process of intellectual, spiritual, and aesthetic development, or as works along those lines, opera, books, works of art, those are culture. 
That's what we mean when we talk about a ministry of culture, usually. And then you have a more academic sense of the term. A culture is a particular way of life of a people or a period or a group or humanity in general. Okay, so I've done culture a little bit, a quick and dirty review of that concept in the West. I'm taking you down to the Amazon now and I'll situate you where I worked. So this is Colombia in the Northwest tip of South America. I worked in the Southern part of Colombia on the Caquetá River Basin. A big chunk of that is known as the Predio Putumayo. And this is a map from my own old thesis from 20 something years ago. This is the Araraquara Canyon right here on the Caquetá River. Very beautiful part, very close to where I worked. And that's the Caquetá Canyon, stunningly beautiful part of the world. I work with people of the center. This is a multi-language group of people. They speak many different languages. With Toto Andoke, Nonuya, Okaina, Muinane, which was the language I learned, known as Fenemunaihetri, Bora, and Miranya. These people consider that what distinguishes them from everybody else around them, other indigenous groups in the area, is tobacco paste. They are the ones who own and inherited from the creator tobacco paste. Other groups don't have tobacco or they do have tobacco, but they consume it differently. White people, in one of the stories I heard, also have their own tobacco, marijuana, and it's the tobacco of madness. Tobacco is grown in gardens through slash and burn horticulture. The leaves are picked off the trees, they're washed because they have a very bitter waxy substance on them boiled and they're boiled for a whole day and this produces this dark juice and then that juice is reduced and thickened with a plant mucus or with a kind of starch that they make also finally that thick paste is mixed with vegetable salt and you lick it they treasure this stuff you need a lot of knowledge and ability and work to make it right so it's treasured and tobacco paste is, well, it's licked in everyday life, also in ritual contexts. You send balls of tobacco paste to other clans up and down river in order to invite them to dance rituals. Two men, when they meet, they greet each other by exchanging tobacco flasks of tobacco paste. And furthermore, tobacco paste, when you lick it, is understood to make your words powerful, effective. They will become true. This is when I came in 2007, 2008 to Araraquara. I visited my compadre Segundo. And this is us exchanging coca and tobacco paste. Um, An example of this power of words, I remember one time I had moved upriver and I saw an airplane flying above and practicing my muinane, I called it a kuhagai mogahe, a fire hawk. And the old man I was with said, please don't call it fire hawk. You now lick tobacco and it makes your words powerful and dangerous. Because you and other people call it fire hawks, they fall and crash and burn. No, you should call it Kamoga, canoe of the heights. Give me one second, folks. Sorry, I was having a sound issue. Um, so a little bit more about tobacco and the story of tobacco. Initially, during the time of creation, the grandfather of tobacco attempted to create human beings. He needed company, somebody to talk to. And 
he failed at first. His first people, the first people, his first talking companions whom he made misbehaved. They corrupted their tobaccos. They were supposed to behave well, be strong, be hardworking, be in control of their bodies, be pleasant, be good. They needed to have memory, remember how to behave properly. Well, these early people failed. They should remember how to treat others, but no, they were instead angry and violent. They should remember you can't have sex with anybody. You can only have sex with certain people. They forgot that. You should work hard and not be lazy. They forgot that. Each kind of original created people misbehaved, corrupted their tobacco, and were transformed. That is the origin of animals of different kinds. They lost their humanity and became animals and jungle spirits. But the grandfather of tobacco kept trying. And in his final trial, he managed to create proper human beings who behaved morally. And then the story goes, there's several stories, they differ. This original human being multiplied, went under the ground and then came up in different parts of the Amazon as different peoples, Jukuna, Carijona, in some cases, whites, and then people of the center. They came out in their own territories from holes in the ground. And so this is what's the story of origin, explaining differences between people. So now I go deeper into how this tobacco relates to culture. You need to know one basic idea. Tobacco is the basic substance out of which people of the center make bodies. The very flesh of every person, the flesh, is made of tobacco. And that tobacco speaks through people. And when tobacco speaks through a person, the person thinks. <clears throat> Whatever you are thinking right now, as you listen to me speak, is the tobacco in your body the tobacco that makes up your flesh sounding through you. Those are your thoughts. But it's not just thoughts in a Western sense because they have one word for thoughts and emotions and attitudes. It's esamai. Thoughts and emotions are the same thing. It's the same internal bodily phenomena. So your thoughts, for instance, if you're paying attention carefully, those are good thoughts coming from good tobacco inside your body. It involves an emotion as well, the disposition to pay attention to somebody who is speaking to you. Tobacco also reminds you. It brings memory it, and moral discernment. That was that first idea I gave you, right? Whenever you know how to behave in certain circumstances, how to react, how to be ethical, the way they put it is that the tobacco reminds you how to behave. When you realize that kicking a child is nasty and that you shouldn't do it, and you avoid doing it, that's the tobacco inside your body, reminding, giving you morality, giving you moral discernment. So you see these attitudes and thoughts and emotions express themselves in ways of interrelating with other people. Tobacco accretes in the body, it builds up in the body. You get it from your father's semen, literally semen, but also from the, that semen is made out of the tobacco your father licked. And he inherited that from his father and his uncles who also licked tobacco and were also made of that. So it accretes in your body through sex and pregnancy. Uh, your mother licks tobacco during her pregnancy. That also adds to the building of your body. Then over your lifetime, you lick tobacco and you consume other substances. So it's not just tobacco that makes your body, it's the main substance. 
but other substances also make up your body. In rituals, there's a lot of tobacco and other substances going into your body. And then finally, there's a nasty side to it. Animals can affect the tobacco in your body. I'll get back to that. So here I'm comparing the transmission of behaviors and attitudes. The ways people do things. People of the center will say that's their tobacco. They got it from the tobacco of their fathers, from the tobacco of their grandfathers. If you compare that with the concept of culture, that's acquired from immersion and participation in social life. I guess you're also acquiring tobacco from participation in rituals and so forth. Still comparing. Both concepts, tobacco and coke and culture, are used in moral evaluations. Tobacco is central to a morality-centered theory of sociality, personhood, and experience. The way they understand feelings and emotions and behaviors and social life centers on tobacco. And it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a theory of social life and personhood that centers on morality, on how people ought to behave, what kinds of persons they should be, what kinds of treatment they should give each other. It is centrally, unavoidably, a moral concept. If you talk about people in terms of tobacco, like people at the center do, you're always talking about their moral acumen, their moral skills. Some accounts of culture that we have used also attend to morality and ethics, but they rarely center it. So that's a... a a similarity with a difference between tobacco and culture. In one article I wrote back in 2005, this was the epigraph at the top, right? Uh, and it was something that this man, this, uh, I asked this man, Nume, also died last, uh, two years ago during the, he died of COVID. Anyway, um, I'll say it in Winani so you can hear what the language sounds like. I asked Nume, Nume, and he responded, Bibo, Tanyabo, no, Bibo. So I was inquiring into animal moralities and I asked him, So how about the jaguar's speech? How are his thoughts and emotions? So what kinds of thoughts and emotions does the tobacco of the jaguar? Remember, jaguars were those early screwed up versions of humanity, failures. So I'm asking, what does the jaguar tobacco make the jaguar think and feel? And Numa said, ah, the jaguar of the tobacco, that one does not remind you that somebody is your brother. So remember something, if you are properly made of good tobacco from your clan, proper human tobacco, as you look upon your brother, you love your brother. As you look upon your sister, you love your sister. You want to care for them, to treat them well. The tobacco recognizes itself in the other person. And the tobacco tells you, ah, this is my brother. This is my sister. When it tells you that, you experience it as love. You love your kin. Jaguars don't experience that. They look at other jaguars made of the same tobacco with them, and they attack them. They feel anger and ferociousness, and they attack them. And so they also say that if a human being experiences hate and odiousness towards other human beings, especially family, they are not really human. It's the false tobacco of jaguars sounding through their bodies, making them feel and act in immoral ways.
Okay, I go back to the comparison. You can use these concepts at different scales, tobacco and culture. Tobacco is in the individual's body, so it can be used to say, my tobacco tells me to behave in this way. So the individual has their own tobacco, but the individual shares the same tobacco with his siblings, her siblings. They were made by their father and their family out of the same tobacco. And you can expand that circle. Not only are my siblings and I made from that, my cousins along a male line, my lineage, we also have the same tobacco. That's why we're all alike. That's why we behave in the same way. Or the clan, a bunch of lineages together make up a clan. The clan shares the same tobacco. Sometimes they, they'll say, no, that lineage has a different tobacco than mine. But then they can expand that and say, no, 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 we are of the same clan, so we have the same tobacco. So you can play with this concept of sharing tobacco at different scales. You can say, for instance, that the entire Muinane speaking or Witoto speakers share the same tobacco, which is different from another language group of people of the center. Indigenous people have different tobacco than white people, they might say. Or they might say, no, no, actually human beings, the human species has one kind of tobacco and animals are the other who has different kinds of tobaccos. So you can see this, you can use tobacco to explain behaviors and emotions and attitudes at different scales. And I'll be very quick, you can do the same with culture. There are cultures of the family, of workplaces or schools, uh, the culture of a city, the culture of the prairies, the culture of Saskatchewan, you name it. The culture of Austria, the culture of Colombia, the culture of Canada, of an entire continent, the European culture, or that weird one, the culture of the West, whatever that includes. Corporate cultures, which bridges the culture of General Electric, the culture of the Coca-Cola company. So you use it at different scales. Okay, both terms can be used in what I call an essentialist fashion, where you attribute homogeneity or sameness to one group of people. People of the center use tobacco for that purpose. They say, oh, that clan over there, they're all made of the same tobacco. That's why they're all angry. They didn't always use it to commend behavior, right? They would say, oh, those people over there, they're all lazy. That's their tobacco. So they essentialize and homogenize that way. Or they say, oh no, our tobacco is very good, very ethical, very moral. All of us. Same goes with culture. Culture is often used and has been used historically in a very homogenizing fashion, where you imagine indigenous people all have the same culture. Austrians are all the same. Germans are all the same, punctual, systematic, right? Where you're imagining homogeneity because of culture. So I'm comparing those terms and saying the same to the both terms can be used to argue that people are homogenous within that group. At the same time, you can use it the other way around to push individual differences, individual uniquenesses, right? People of the center will say, my tobacco speaks to me. If your tobacco tells you to build a house, he's telling you. He's not telling everybody your brother, it's you. If your tobacco tells you to behave in a certain way, react in a certain way to a situation, that's you as an individual. Culture can be used for that, but it's not that good. Many theories of culture are not very good at addressing individuality. 
Both concepts can be used ethnocentrically. Uh, I witnessed cases where they would say, oh no, only our lineage uh, lives properly and well. And other lineages and neighbors just close by down river are oversexed, violent, angry, and lazy. Uh, the people of from the Yukunas from way down river, oh no, no, very questionably, questionable moral, right? Uh, so the tobacco is sometimes used as an ethnocentric concept to exclude others and treat them as inferior, morally. I've already gone over the concept of culture. I mean, as soon as you tie culture to civilization and say there's a single path of development, it's ethnocentric. The idea that European culture is superior to others was very common. The idea that our culture gets it right, that it's more rational or ethical. Calling other people's features as barbaric cultural practices runs that risk of being profoundly ethnocentric. And it can still be used snobbishly. In the other direction, both terms can be used relativistically for tolerance. The inspiration for this lecture was one old man kind of contradicting his fellows when he was in the coca circle licking tobacco paste and talking to them. It was dark that night. And he said, you know what? Every human group received tobacco from the creator God. And it had a different form. The Jukuna received tobacco snuff. White people received a different kind of tobacco. We received tobacco paste. Other people received alcoholic drinks which they use powerfully and shamanically. And with those substances, they make people and live well. And it was a very, wow, it sounded very tolerant and quite beautiful to me, the idea. I liked the idea. Um, so I found it that interesting that the concept could be used that way, relativistically, for tolerance. Similarly with the concept of culture. Not only anthropologists, but anthropologists certainly use the term to say everybody is cultured. Everybody has culture. I'll be quick. The concepts differ in the kind of universe they take place in. So this whole theory of tobacco shaping people makes sense in a universe, a cosmos, that was created by a creator God. So you need a God in this world. And it's a world saturated with spirits and entities. And it's a world in which bodies are the main ethical substance. By that, I mean bodies are what you work on to make people, not souls. If you take the Christian world, for instance, very often there's this idea that what we are all working on in the Christian world is the soul, keeping it clean, keeping it pure, keeping it free of sin in order eventually to go to heaven. So you work on the soul. The ethical substance among people at the center is the body. You're making good people who remember, who remember how to treat each other properly. So the body is the main ethical substance. Culture is a more secular concept. Sometimes there may be a God, sometimes not. It makes sense in an imagined universe in which culture is a part of an overarching objective nature. So you might think, for instance, human beings evolved biologically. And among the features they evolved, they evolved was a biological capacity for culture. Carlos, I'm sorry, but I think you have to come to an end now. Did you hear me? Yes. Can I do one more? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the key idea is, 
And a key difference is bodies are made. Bodies are fabricated. We are not born with our bodies. Rather, we are made by our the people around us. So I do PowerPoint with more enthusiasm than skill. So if you look at this, what these people are doing is they're going to make people. They take ritually the elements of people and ritually, what is this? And ritually fashion. This did not work, sorry. Huh. It was supposed to travel slowly and make that little body in the middle to point to the idea that the body is made by everybody around you. So there's this idea that we are incomplete as human beings. All the time we're incomplete. But when we interact with each other, like this, it changes our bodies. So you've got this, you get the interaction, and it changes the person. And it changes the person. This is not working. So you have that person there. As soon as there's any interaction, you talk to the person, you give them food, you hug them, you kiss them, you accompany them. It changes their bodies and it makes them into different kinds of people. Here, this person became fat and healthy and beautiful. Western culture tends to imagine more that we interact with each other as full-fledged finished individuals, which is finished individuals then interact with each other. Uh, I will leave it at that. If there's questions about my next few pictures and if I have a chance to bring it up, I will. One, maybe one final thing, just so that maybe we could posit more questions is the indigenous way of talking about people and persons makes them pay very careful attention to the kinds of relationships that make a certain body possible. We might look at this body on this screen and say, what an individual, how powerful, how strong, he must lift heavy weights, he must be, he must have worked hard. People of the center, focused on the body and the relationships that make a body would say, lots of people must have fed this person. The social condition in this person's group must have made weights available so this person could develop that body. Okay, I will leave it there for now and uh, hope that the questions bring us back more to people of the center and that comparison between culture and tobacco. Thank you, Carlos. Are there any questions? Well, I have one question here. Who, can you hear me, Carlos? I can hear you. Who is allowed to grow, harvest, and produce the place? Is it only men? Is there an age they must be in order to participate in the process? Are the individual tobacco crops linked to particular family groups, and narratives, stories, myths, etc.? Okay, I am not sure I heard everything, but I heard the first part for sure. Mm -hmm. And tobacco is grown by men, although the gardening, there's a shared garden where the women, women own their own powerful substances. Women own, for instance, hot chilies, hot peppers, which also make a part of people's bodies. They own manioc. Uh, but tobacco belongs to the men, and it's to the men of the patriline. A group of men own their tobacco. And it's supposed to be their own lineage of tobacco, which is different from their neighbors. And they grow it in gardens. Each man is supposed to harvest it. It's very important and very meaningful. When a man gives you his tobacco paste or you to lick, he's showing that he is not lazy because he worked hard to produce that tobacco, that he's knowledgeable 
because it takes knowledge to build tobacco. Um, so it's, it's, he's saying something important, right? And he's also giving you something generously because tobacco is going to awaken your mind, make you intelligent, give you speech, give you health. Um, the question was, is there an age? There must be? Yes. Participate and they must be men. Well, no. Women and men and children lick tobacco from early childhood. Not as much as adults, but it's part of growing up and becoming healthy and good and strong and so forth is you get a little bit of tobacco, especially when there's an important lesson to be learned, an important life lesson. You should lick a little bit. And then that lesson is really going to become part of your body. Is there a question here in the audience? Yes, I have one good question. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, I have one brief question. So for this specific, specific group of people, they only lick tobacco or they also smoke it? Or smoking is a completely different <laughs> They also smoke it for cure for curing actual somebody who has shamanic knowledge might smoke and blow so yes there's and the myths tell that the creator god animated the first human beings by blowing tobacco smoke through the crown of the head but um the main ritual substance is liquid paste Thank you. yeah they do say that certain other neighboring indigenous groups received tobacco uh, from smoking tobacco from the creator god. I have another and question. Sorry. I've just gone into Rav to Carlos. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, what is the relation to licking tobacco and gender in this patrilineal society? The tobacco that women lick, how does it function differently? everybody's made of tobacco men and women and so women have women are also made of tobacco they also lick tobacco um it is a gendered substance and there is gendering uh women do not get as much symbolic punch from having or not having tobacco paste. If a man does not have tobacco paste, he is a little more shy. He may say, you know what? We're all talking and we are at a meeting, uh, but I don't want to speak too much because shamefully, I ran out of tobacco and a man should never run out of tobacco. So I had better be silent because mm -hmm. I am speaking in a way that others might think is empty. It's not made powerful. It's not backed up by tobacco. So that happens to men on occasion. It wouldn't happen to a woman, really. To a woman, something like that would happen if she doesn't have hot chili paste. Okay. Then it's embarrassing. If a woman does not have hot, spicy chili paste, is she even a woman? They might say. Okay, so you could have the same uh, speech about chili? Could you refer? To I could, I could give a lecture somewhat similar to this one about hot chilies, for okay. sure. <laughs> although, although tobacco is the the central one. This is a patrilineal society, right? There is a sort of masculinist inclination in in these understandings, for sure. Yeah, because there came up another question. What about the women who belong to a different Patrick clan? Women who belong to a different Patrick clan. Yes. If it's if the tobacco is linked to the to the patrilineal clan, so what about the women who belong to another clan? Yeah, so okay, if, when we're talking about having babies and babies' behaviors, the claim is mostly it comes from the tobacco of the father, the paternal grandfather, mm -hmm. the paternal great-grandfather. That's mm -hmm. what most supposedly explains the behavior. 
But the mother's substances also have some influence. Yes. So um, but the woman, the woman is made of her father's tobacco. So she brings with her behaviors and so forth that come from that clan. Okay. I have a question. Like, you, know, um, you said that if somebody behaves bad, it's because of this tobacco. But is there any ch chance of, uh, of battery? I mean, he's made of this tobacco. He behaves badly. So what happens now? He will behave badly for the rest of his life? You've just opened the door to my topic of research. Okay, let me stop it here. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's what I love to research. It's tobacco, it's 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 a concept, and people can use it like like any concept, like any story. People can use it to interpret their own lives, and they change it. They right. So if somebody misbehaves, uh, people might say, some might say, oh, you know what? That's their tobacco. The people in that village. They are crazed, oversexed people. They always are inappropriate sexually. Whereas some elder from that clan might say, in the face of somebody from the clan who misbehaved, might say, oh, no, 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 no. Our clan's tobacco is always moral and good, but sorcery, a nasty, evil old man from down river used sorcery to put a bad animal tobacco a monkey tobacco into my son. And that's why he's behaving immorally over sex like a monkey or like a tapir. And that's why he's behaving that way. My tobacco would never behave that way. And they, they debate, they fight, but it's available as a concept to talk about moral issues. Yeah, but there's no better way in this. Just well, I did not hear that, sorry. You cannot better yourself. You say so, maybe. You cannot, John. You know, I mean, if you make Can you improve on yourself? No, I'm so sorry. We have to stop anyway because we are really over our time. Oh. And it's a very, it's very unfortunate that you're not here with us because we're not going to smoke, but we are going to have a drink, all of us who are sitting here. In we should have licked some tobacco for sure. <laughs> so I hope. But next time you will be with us. Anytime you want a longer lecture, you have heard me speak. I'm very long-winded. Yes. And I'm available for deeper conversations if you want. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting. Uh, yeah. Vielen Dank. Tschüss.